Create optical lighting and illumination and laser systems with Optic Studio, the industry-leading optical design software from ZMAX. Thank you for joining me today. The webinar will be about simulating image quality in Optic Studio. My name is Kristen Norton and I will be your host. So here's an overview of the topics that we're going to cover. I'll start by reviewing sequential mode in Optic Studio, and then we'll jump right into the image simulation tool in Optic Studio, and I have some examples set up to show you. Um, I'll also cover some of the other features that we have for simulating images in Optic Studio, um, and also when to use them. Uh, so this includes the geometric image analysis, uh, geometric bitmap image analysis, the partially coherent image analysis and the extended diffraction image analysis tool. Uh, then I'll show you an example using the geometric image analysis uh, and then two more examples, uh, one that shows the relative illumination tool and then one that shows the light source analysis tool. We don't typically do uh, introductions in the webinars, but I, I thought it would be nice to start. So my name is Kristen Norton, as I mentioned, and I'm the product manager for Optic Studio. Before that, I was a senior optical engineer here at ZMAX. And before that, I was in the hardware world and working as a laser and optics engineer. Uh, and my background is in physics and applied physics. If you'd like to get to know us better, you are more than welcome to stop by our booth at Photonics West. It's booth number 1540, and we'll be demoing both Optic Studio and Lens Mechanics there. All right, so let's get started. I've shown this slide in the past uh, during a webinar that talked about how to get started within Optic Studio and which mode you should use. I'm showing it again today because I want to uh, sort of direct you and show you that really we're only going to be talking about uh, one subset of the capabilities within Optic Studio in sequential mode. And uh, even within sequential mode, we're only going to be talking about the tools and features that you can use to help you simulate image quality in imaging systems. Okay, so uh, let's get started with a quick review of sequential mode. This is just a screenshot showing a very uh, classic triplet design. In sequential mode, the rays start at the object plane and propagate sequentially surface by surface to the image plane. In the lens data editor here, you can see surface zero is represented as the object and then surface seven is the image. So then in the layout screenshot shown here, the rays are propagating left to right, where the rightmost surface is the image surface. Uh, the lenses are defined one surface at a time, so that means that lens one is defined by two surfaces. This is surface one in the lens data editor, and then the back face of the lens is surface two. Okay, so the rays start out at infinity from the object surface, um, so when they uh, enter the system, they uh, uh, are coming in collimated or parallel, and then propagate sequentially down to the image plane. Uh, the stop surface is what we call the most limiting aperture in the system, and the image of the stop surface gives us the entrance pupil and the exit pupil. So the entrance pupil is just the stop surface as seen from the object plane on the left-hand side, and the exit pupil is that stop surface as seen from the image plane, uh, which in the screenshot shown here is on the right-hand side. In sequential mode, the rays are very systematically launched to fill the entrance pupil. And in the screenshot shown here, the stop surface is the uh, surface that's highlighted in orange. So we often get asked, how do we define the source? Um, and there are two key things um, in addition to defining the wavelengths, obviously. Uh, but in sequential mode, you need to define uh, the size of your stop surface or your system aperture. And then you also need to define field points. And that defines uh, the different input angles um, that the rays take into your system. So in the screenshot shown here, we have blue rays, which represent the on-axis bundle. Uh, we also have green rays, green rays, which come in at a slightly larger off-axis angle. And then the red rays are coming in at the uh, largest off-axis angle. 
Uh, in the previous example, the object was at infinity, so the rays were coming in collimated, but we can also define a source that's a finite distance away. So in this example here, uh, the object is uh, 100 lens units, or millimeters in this case, from the front surface of the first lens. Uh, because it's a finite distance away, I can define my field points instead of being by angle, as they were in the previous example, but here I can define them by object height. So the largest field point is 20 millimeters, so therefore the size of my object or the size of my source uh, would be up to 20 millimeters in Y, and you can see the semi-diameter is automatically updated based on the largest value here. Okay, so these are some of the analyses that are available in sequential mode in the Analyze tab. And today we're going to be talking about this group here. Um, so these are all of the analyses within the Extended Scene Analysis drop-down menu. So the first um, tool in that group is Image Simulation. Uh, this is a very commonly used tool for simulating uh, imaging performance of your sequential system. It can be difficult to set up though, so I wanted to take a good chunk of this webinar just explaining how you set up image simulation. And then after that, we'll go through some examples that show you how to include uh, the effects of diffraction, aberrations, uh, the image orientation, uh, distortion, and polarization as well. Uh, but the way image simulation works is really with the three steps shown here. Uh, you first place a source bitmap at the object surface, uh, then Optic Studio computes an array of point spread functions across the full field. Uh, then it convolves the source bitmap that you defined with the calculated array of point spread functions, and that's what gives you the simulated image. So let me switch to Optic Studio. Uh, here I have open a pretty simple file. Um, I have got one lens here, um, and then this is actually a paraxial lens, uh, which is focusing the rays down to the image plane here. Um, this is supposed to represent a singlet eyepiece, so then these uh, field points would be coming from the focal plane of uh, an objective lens that came before this. Um, and so also the um, effective focal length of the paraxial lens here is representative of um, the focal length of the eye. Um, of course, this is just a representation because this is also a flat plane that we're showing here, but it works well for this example. Uh, so looking in the lens data editor, we have our object plane, the front of our lens, the back of our lens, and a paraxial lens. Very simple. And if you look in the Image, image simulation analysis. I already have this set up, but like I said, I'll walk you through it in just a moment. Here you can see we had a source file um, that was convolved with that array of PSFs, and here we have the predicted imaging quality, which is very poor. Okay, so now let me switch back to the PowerPoint, and we'll walk through step by step how to get this result. The first thing you need to do is select your source bitmap. So if we expand the settings uh, for the image simulation analysis, you'll see the very first setting is a drop-down menu where you can select the input file. Um, I added a picture of uh, some members from ZMAX who were at um, Optics and Photonics uh, this last year in August. Um, I did edit the picture so that uh, uh, the, the resolution and size is not as good as the original, but it makes the calculation go very quickly for this example. I also know that it's uh, 640 by uh, 495 pixels. Um, this can be helpful when you're trying to figure out uh, the right field height size or your detector settings, um, as we'll see later. So I would recommend including uh, the pixels in the input file title. Uh, so in addition to choosing the input file, you also will set the field height. Okay, it can be a little confusing because the field height doesn't have units uh, displayed here, and that's because the units on the number are specified by the field type you have selected. Uh, so that means it is easiest if your uh, field, fields are defined by lens units or units of length which would be object height, like I showed in the previous slide here. Okay, object height. 
And then, um, so now we know the units, but then the, this field height is going to be the full height of the image. Okay. So I have a little diagram shown here where I have the um, uh, different uh, pixels along the X and Y axes to show the orientation. And then um, you, this arrow would represent the maximum field as specified in the field data editor. So then the value that I would want to specify for the field height here would be this full height, assuming I want my picture to fit inside the full field of view that I have defined. Um, so in this case, some quick trigonometry um, gives me about 14 for the field height. And when I'm first setting this up, uh, we can also just show it as uh, the source bitmap, so you get the before picture. All right, so let me go back to Optic Studio and I'll open up a new instance of image simulation and we will just start from the beginning. Oh, it's using the last settings I had defined, but here my input file is my picture from optics and photonics, field heights 14, and we're just going to show the source bitmap here in the show as settings. I already have it rotated because I know um, my system ha um, has a negative magnification, so it'll flip it upside down. But here you can see the, uh, the source image. Okay, so the next setting here, we need to set up uh, the grid of point spread functions or the convolution grid settings as it's labeled in uh, the analysis window here. Okay, So we're going to start by just setting the number of uh, uh, point spread function points in x and y to 1. So they'll just be one point spread function right in the middle. In addition, we're also going to start by ignoring all of these aberrations. So that means that I'm going to have one point spread function in the middle, which is just going to be a delta function. Okay. Um, it will, the point spread function would uh, spread out and change as we're considering aberrations, but because they're being ignored, that's what makes it a delta function. Um, and this will give us a baseline image because any function that's convolved with a delta function will just yield the initial function. Okay. As soon as that uh, point spread function again becomes more um, spread out, that's when we'll start to see changes in the simulated image. The reason we're starting off with this is that it gives us a baseline image that just shows distortion, okay? and then we can start to add aberrations and diffraction effects if it's a diffraction limited system. All right, so whoops, switching back to Optic Studio here. I'm going to change source bitmap to uh, simulated image. And I'm going to turn off auto apply now so I don't have to keep waiting for it to update. I'm going to change these values back to zero because this is how it will be when you first open up uh, the analysis if you don't have any uh, settings that were saved before. But here you can see my um, number of points in X and Y are 1, and the aberrations are none. Okay. So this means that our simulated image is only going to include uh, distortion or image rotation too, as you can see. So to make this image easier to compare with the original, I'm going to rotate the source 180 degrees. One thing that I like to do when I'm setting up image simulation is to clone it and uh, create a reference immediately behind. So then when I switch in between tabs, it's really easy to see the differences. So I'm going to set this one back to the unrotated source bitmap. And as I switch between this image simulation tab and the other, you can see the distortion effects in particular out at the edges. We could also compare this to the, uh, dis the grid distortion tool in the Analyze tab. Let me turn on the vector line so you can see here the uh, blue X's represent where the rays actually land, but the perfect grid represents uh, where the rays would land if, it, if there weren't any distortion. 
Um, so it does make sense. We can tell that uh, the pattern of the rays here corresponds to the distortion that we see in the difference between these two images as well. Okay, so let me switch back to the PowerPoint. All right, so here's our baseline image. Uh, this is the next section of the settings in the image analysis feature. Um, and uh, we started out with the number of uh, pixels and the size of the pixels uh, for the detector as zero. This means that Optic Studio is automatically calculating the number of pixels and the size. Uh, the number of pixels um, will just match whatever you have in, in terms of the resolution uh, from the input scene. And uh, then the size will automatically be scaled just based on the magnification of the lens. Okay. I'm actually going to type in the detector settings that are shown here though. Um, so we're going to say the pixel size is 0.017 millimeters and we're going to pick a, a pi the number of pixels in X and Y that matches the ratio of the pixels in the uh, original source as well, so the scaling should make sense. So here I said 0.017, and then my number of pixels in X, I gotta turn off auto apply again, sorry about that. My number of pixel in X is 1280, number of pixels in Y is 990. Okay, now I'll see slightly different scaling in the result. There you go, we can see this black region here where the detector is not picking anything up. You can also see some of the color fringing at the edges. Okay, so now we have the detector set up correctly. Uh, now let me go back to the PowerPoint and here we'll set up the convolution grid settings. So here in the screenshot you can see we need to change show as from simulated image to PSF grid. And this is when we're going to increase the number of uh, points in X and Y, as well as the uh, sampling density across the pupil and then again at the image. Um, so the way you choose the number of points in X and Y depends on how quickly you expect the aberrations to be changing across the field. So if your aberrations are not changing very quickly, then you don't need very many points. Um, if they are changing quickly, then you need to increase it. A general rule of thumb is um, start with it low, start increasing it, and if you increase it and don't see any change in the image, uh, then you have uh, an adequately sampled uh, point spread function grid. Okay, so um, also for the aberrations uh, selection here, you can choose geometric or diffraction. Um, the example that I'm using is very clearly not diffraction limited, so uh, the uh, geometric uh, computation should be just fine. If you choose diffraction, it uses the uh, Huygens uh, diffraction algorithm to calculate that. So let's go back to Optic Studio and expand the settings again. So I'll change my show as from simulated image to the PSF grid. And I'm going to increase my pupil sampling and image sampling to uh, 64 by 64. And the number of points in X and Y for the PSF will be 7 by 7. And change the aberrations to geometric. Actually, just for reference, I'll leave this at none. And then you can see what happens when they get switched to geometric. So with none, I have a, an array of little white dots. If you zoom in. These are pretty clearly delta functions. This looks like it's just one pixel. Let me zoom back out. Now, if I turn on aberrations, you will see that each of these dots represents a point spread function that's computed. Okay, zooming in, you can see uh, the different color effects uh, right in the middle. And let's zoom in on the outside you can clearly see this is no longer a delta function and it is significantly spread out. So that means that our uh, point spread uh, grid is pretty well sampled. Um, so if diffraction effects or, um, meaning if it's a diffraction limited system, or if you know that 
you have aberrations which will be impacting these point spread functions, then you really need to make sure that the point spread function is several pixels wide. Otherwise, the aberrated point spread function could hide within one pixel and could deceptively look like a delta function. Okay. Um, in this case, especially at the corners, you can see this does cover several pixels, so we should be good. All right, so let me go back to my um, image simulation settings and I'm going to change the show as back to the simulated image. The last detector settings that I ent entered in are still saved. Okay, so we're good. And I click OK. And now you can see our clearly aberrated image. Let me dock this here, um, and I'm going to change this image simulation to show the simulated image um, ignoring aberrations. Okay. And then we can use that. Oops, I have to rotate it. To show the difference between here's the image with distortion versus the image with distortion, detector settings, and uh, including aberrations. OK, so we talked about this result and the difference in point spread functions across the grid. And here's the final result. So clearly, like I said, this system is very aberrated. It's not diffraction limited, uh, but if this were a better system, you might see an array of delta functions in that PSF grid. So that could mean that your source bitmap is just not aberrated by the lenses in your system. Um, so that would mean that for that source scene or the source bitmap and for the detector settings that you've selected, the lens just isn't what's limiting the performance. Um, but you should check to see if the size of for example, the pixels that you specified in your detector settings, if those are larger than your airy disk, uh, then the optical system could instead be detector limited. Right. Um, and so, again, we kind of talked about this already, but if you want to see the effects of aberrations, you may need to increase the resolution, meaning you may need to make it so that the point spread functions will cover multiple pixels. And there are a few ways you can do this. Uh, one would be making the source bitmap smaller. So that would be reducing that field height number. So that um, changes the, the size of the pixels in your input file, um, thus increasing the resolution. You also can choose to oversample. Um, and so, um, oversampling increases the pixel resolution of the source bitmap as well, and it does this by copying one pixel into uh, two, four, or uh, more uh, identical adjacent pixels. So the purpose of that feature is to increase the number of pixels per field unit. Um, okay, so this is just a screenshot showing an example oversampling of 2x. Um, you also could take a look at how uh, the aberrations uh, would get worse and worse as you move off axis. Um, so we do have uh, a field setting here in the source bitmap settings. It's highlighted in this screenshot. Um, and this is just a quick way to move off axis um, to, to investigate potentially more problematic areas. Uh, but don't confuse this field setting with the field height setting, which in the screenshot here is 15. So the field setting shown in the drop down menu that's highlighted here, uh, this just moves the um, source bitmap to be centered about that field point. Um, okay, so the uh, diagram shown here shows that you know, this might be your original bitmap size and position, but if you move it up to three, that would be centering it up here. Uh, this screenshot's also showing a smaller size um, as well, but you don't necessarily need to reduce the size. Okay, so one more slide on image simulation. Okay, so um, what impacts the performance of your imaging system? Uh, there are three main things, and all of these things are included in image simulation. So you have the 
optical performance. Um, but then you also have your source scene resolution and your detector resolution, both of which can be adjusted using the settings of image simulation. Um, but remember, image simulation is convolving a source bitmap file with a grid of point spread functions. So the only rays that are being traced are to calculate the point spread function. Um, that means that we don't have rays which are traced from every single pixel on your um, in your source bitmap. And so this tool can't be used to calculate things like your system efficiency, right? so the percentage of rays or the intensity uh, right at the image plane. However, these assumptions that we're making and, and the way this convolution works makes it um, a very fast and accurate way to predict the appearance of uh, any input scene that you select. This is a really fast tool, like I said, it's multi-threaded and it gives you a really great signal to noise ratio. Uh, just to review, it covers aberrations, distortion and image orientation as we just saw in the example that I showed you. Um, I'm just going to show you another example that shows how it considers uh, the effects of polarization. And I'll show you one more um, that is an example of a diffraction limited system. And then later on, we'll talk about uh, relative illumination, but this tool also considers that. Okay, so now let's uh, switch to the next two examples I have here. All right, so we'll go back to Optic Studio. And I'm looking for image sim example two. Okay, this is an extremely simple system. We have rays coming in collimated and then you can tell based on the arrows here and here that this is a paraxial lens. Looking in the lens data editor, you can see we have just a slab of NBK7, but the key thing here is that it has this coding blue notch. So if we look at the transmission versus wavelength, um, looking across the wavelength spectrum here, that's the x-axis, and then the uh, y-axis is the intensity transmission, uh, there's a big chunk here of uh, blue light that doesn't make it through. So the image simulation tool will reflect this. This is the simulated image, but let me show you the source bitmap. Okay. So here's the source bitmap, which included the blue circle here. And if we go back to the simulated image, okay, you can see the blue is, is completely removed. So let's move on to the next image simulation example. Um, so the last system was showing how image simulation accounts for coatings and all of the polarization effects that are um, uh, calculated there. Uh, and this example talks about a diffraction limited system. Uh, this is a telescope. Um, here you can see the rays are coming in here. We have primary mirror, secondary mirror, and then the rays come down uh, through a hole in the mirror here to the image plane. Um, if we look at the spot diagram, um, I have the airy radius turned on. And you can see that this is very clearly diffraction uh, limited. All of these rays are falling within the airy disk, which is not physically possible. So uh, let's start by looking at the geometric image analysis, which I haven't explained fully yet. I'll get to it in just a moment. Um, but as you can tell from the title, the geometric image analysis is a purely geometric calculation. So it's predicting um, an image with uh, pretty crisp edges. So the, the source file here, as you can tell, is just uh, the letter F. Now, if we look at the image simulation that's open, this is showing the uh, PSF grid, clearly very well sampled. And here's the F that image simulation is predicting, which does include diffraction effects. So we see the blurring of the edges all around here. Okay, so that's it for the um, image simulation examples. Um, now I'll briefly cover some of the other analysis tools that we have uh, for simulating images. 
Uh, the first is geometric image analysis, and I will show you an example of this later. Uh, like I said just a moment ago, this is uh, limited to geometric computations. Um, and instead of being a convolution with a grid of uh, point spread functions, this is actually entirely uh, ray trace based, meaning all the pixels in your source file uh, will have rays traced from them. This also means that you can calculate the system efficiency, so the percentage of rays that make it through your system or the relative intensity. Uh, we can also compute multimode fiber coupling this way. We have a separate knowledge base article about that, so I won't be covering it here. Um, but at uh, the end of the webinar, I'll show you an email address you can uh, use to follow up with us. And if you are interested in that, I can send you the knowledge base article. One of the nice things about geometric image analysis is that it can be calculated on any surface, unlike image simulation, which can only be computed at the image plane. Um, next, we have the geometric bitmap image analysis tool, and this is uh, also similar to image simulation, um, except it's limited to geometric computations. Um, so it is, it's, it's computed um, in a way that's more similar to image simulation um, than it is to the geometric image analysis, um, but Typically, image simulation has a much higher signal-to-noise ratio, um, so it, it is the preferred analysis. Um, but times when you would want to use the geometric bitmap image analysis are when you just want to double-check the predicted performance from image simulation. Um, I, I talked about earlier how to set up the uh, grid of point spread functions, but in the beginning, especially if you're not used to using the tool, it can be pretty difficult to detect if you have an undersampled uh, PSF grid. And as we know, an undersampled PSF grid just looks like a grid of delta functions, which will uh, predict overly optimistic performance. So uh, this tool could be used just to double check because if you see performance that's a lot worse from this analysis, then you'll know you need to go back and uh, redo some of the settings from image simulation. Okay, there are two more uh, tools I'll just talk about briefly. Uh, that's the uh, partially coherent image analysis tool. And this computes the uh, coherent, incoherent, or partially coherent uh, diffraction image of a scene that's defined by a bitmap image. Uh, this is really important for uh, photolithography systems where you need to include uh, the coherence of the source. Um, but if your source is incoherent, use image simulation instead. Um, You'll see that same note here at the bottom for the next tool, the Extended Diffraction Image Analysis tool as well. Um, this tool is similar to the Partially Coherent Image Analysis, um, except that the Optical Transfer Function, or OTF, can vary uh, across the field of view of the image. Um, and in addition, the illumination has to be fully coherent or incoherent. However, if it's incoherent, then we do rep uh, recommend you use image simulation instead. Um, uh, this tool allows each pixel in the source bitmap to represent a separate delta function, and so that can be really useful for imaging extended scenes that contain point sources, um, and one of the common examples of this would be a scene that contains uh, stars, right, because those would look like point sources. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about geometric image analysis, uh, which I, I referenced briefly two slides ago. Uh, but this is one of my favorite tools, so I do want to talk about it a little bit more, and then I'll show you an example. Um, but geometric image analysis uh, is a, uh, a ray tracing based tool, and rays are generated by each pixel in uh, the source file that you use. The position of uh, the ray within that pixel is chosen uh, randomly. In addition, the output angle of the ray is chosen randomly using the entrance pupil coordinates. Uh, but the distribution of rays overall will be uniform over the pixels as well as the entrance pupil. Um, in addition, the wavelength of each ray is selected randomly and it's proportional to the uh, wavelength weights that you have specified in your wavelength data editor. All right, so now I'll open up the sample file with that. Geometric image analysis. Uh, so this is just using one of our sample files. It's that Cook triplet again. Um, and here you can see the spot diagram uh, showing 
the resulting uh, ray distribution from each of the three field points. And one thing I wanted to show is that uh, geometric image analysis can be used to also show um, the spot diagram. So in the settings here, I set the field size to zero. So that means the file that I have selected here has no um, effect on um, the RAID distributions. Okay, so, so the rays that are launched are coming from a, essentially a point source here. And the reason that this is helpful is because it can be difficult to tell the relative intensity levels from a point spread, or sorry, from a spot diagram when it's drawn like this. But the geometric image analysis tool allows you to display it in false color. Okay, so I changed the settings from spot diagram, which was in the previous analysis, to false color. So I can specify the number of pixels. And then you have a much better idea of what the spot diagram would look like if it were measured in real life and, and where your hot spots would be. Okay. Um, you also can show a cross section, okay, which again gives you um, more meaningful information in terms of the uh, density of all of these uh, spots that we're seeing. Okay, so the next tool um, I'm, I'll show you is relative illumination. Um, this is a really fast way to evaluate um, the relative illumination as a function of radial field coordinate. Okay, so it's another one of those extended analyses. Um, but it also computes the effective F number. Um, uh, so in this case, we're defining relative illumination as the um, intensity um, Y of illumination per unit area um, of the image surface. And this is normalized to the illumination at the point in the field that has the maximum illumination. Um, so note that this may not be on axis. The screenshot shown here does have the peak um, relative illumination at the Y field is zero. Okay. And the relative illumination decreases as Y increases here. Um, but there are some scenarios where, let's see, for example, distortion would actually cause this curve to go the other way. Um, there'll be a higher concentration of rays um, out at the edge of the field, and so the relative illumination will increase. Uh, and, and this analysis allows you to very, very quickly analyze that. Uh, this computation includes, here at the bottom you can see, um, any appetization settings, like Gaussian appetization that you have set. Um, if you have vignetting factors set, it'll account for those, any apertures, um, as well as obviously any aberrations um, or variations in F number, um, image surface shape, angle of incidence, and polarization effects. So I'll just show you where that tool is here now. In the Analyze tab, Extended Scene Analysis, Relative Illumination. And to get the F number, that's in the text tab here. And you can see the effective F number for all of these different uh, field points here. OK, the last tool that I'll talk about is the light source analysis. Um, and this is the only feature um, thus far that's not available in the standard edition. Uh, this feature is only available in the premium editions of Optic Studio. Um, but this creates an image in sequential mode by tracing ray rays that are defined in a source file. Okay. So this uh, is very similar to non-sequential mode, uh, where in non-sequential mode you can define a source using a source file and the rays are traced non-sequentially from that. Right, so this is almost the same thing, except we're tracing sequential rays from the source file. So let me switch back to Optic Studio. And uh, we have an example of a condenser uh, file. Um, this, this file is included with the demo as well. It's in um, the design application sample folder. 
I have it tweaked a little bit for this example because I set it up with a light source analysis. If you are interested in testing uh, this feature and you don't have the premium edition, uh, this is available in the trial version of Optic Studio. Um, and, and to set it up, you will need uh, a source file. And to do that, you just go to the Libraries tab, uh, Radiant Source Models, and Download Radiant Source Models. Uh, the demo or trial edition of Optic Studio has some sample models, and the example that I have here is one of the ones uh, from that, so you, so you can test this yourself. Um, the sample file that I have set up here is a condenser, so um, we are moving the light that comes from a source here and imaging it over to an image plane right here. So this is the source model uh, that I plugged into my light source analysis tool. And here you can see the simulated image, which came from that tool. Okay. Here in the drop down settings, all you have to do is select uh, the source file. Just like again, I said you would define a non sequential source. Okay, well, that's it for today. So just to review, uh, we covered what sequential mode is in Optic Studio, just did a brief review of that. Uh, then I talked about how to use image simulation and showed you some image simulation examples. We talked about when you could use some of the other analyses that we have uh, for simulating images. And then I showed you an example using the geometric image analysis tool, as well as uh, these last two things with relative illumination and the light source analysis. Okay, thank you very much for attending this webinar. Really appreciate your interest in ZMAX and in Optic Studio. If this is your first time attending a webinar, you can uh, submit questions over in the GoToWebinar control panel. There's a question section um, that you need to expand. And if you type in a question there, it'll get sent directly to me and I will try to answer the questions as they come in. Okay. If I don't have time to answer all of the questions, which certainly does happen, please feel free to email us. You can email us at support at zmax.com and we will try to answer your questions via email. All right, so with that, I will take all of your questions. All right, I see your questions coming in. Thank you very much for submitting them. Looks like uh, the first question is, to calculate field height for the image simulation tool, you need the max field. Um, how do you calculate the max field? Uh, so uh, this is actually very straightforward. It's just uh, the maximum field setting in your field data editor. Uh, the maximum field calculation will vary depending on if you're using um, a rectangular normalization or um, circular. Um, but typically, if you're just specifying fields in X or Y, it'll just be the maximum value. Otherwise, you'll just need to do a little bit of trigonometry. Okay, let's see the next setting, or sorry, the next question is, can you clarify what the difference is between the pupil sampling setting and the PSF X points and the PSF Y points? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, so, uh, these are questions about the input settings for the image simulation tool. And uh, the pupil sampling as well as the image sampling uh, settings are the uh, grid sampling density uh, that's used either in pupil space or in image space. So the pupil sampling settings, again, it's the grid sampling that's used in pupil space which is used to compute the PSF grid. So you can think of that like the ray density. And then image sampling, uh, very similar. Again, it's a grid sampling setting, but this is what's used to sample the source bitmap, um, um, which is used to compute the PSF grid as well. Uh, then the number of PSF X and Y points are the uh, number of point spread functions that are being calculated. So the question of how many PSF X and Y points to use depends on how quickly your aberrations are changing across the field um, because everything in between those grid points is interpolated. Um, so if you have aberrations that vary 
very drastically across the field, then you'll need a higher number of points, whereas if they're um, kind of more smoothly changing, you'll only need a few. Um, for all of the sampling settings, and in addition, the number of points, the general rule of thumb is to continue increasing the settings until you don't notice a change in the results. Okay, let's see, another question. Uh, can image simulation include the effect of sensor pixels um, and different pixel sizes? Um, and sensor is capitalized here, and I'm assuming that's to distinguish between uh, the input pixel size, and the answer is yes. Uh, that would be in the, um, in the detector settings. So we, we just call it a little bit differently. But in the detector settings, you can specify the number of pixels and the pixel size. Um, so that's how you would essentially tell if your system is detector limited or not. Um, are the charts available for further review and working through the examples? Yes, uh, we will be uploading a zipped file with all of the examples and uh, the source bitmap uh, to our website very soon. It'll be in the section uh, that's called Optic Studio Recordings. Is the relative illumination from the object plane, and is it relative to what exactly? Okay, that's a that's a very good question. Um, so it's a normalized calculation, and you'll notice that the units are um, in field units. So it's what it's displaying is how the um, relative uh, illumination changes across across the field, so meaning as the rays are traced from the object to the image plane, then how, um, how does the resulting relative illumination change? And again, relative just means that the peak is calculated and it's normalized relative to that. Okay, another question, how can I analyze the results of image simulation? Uh, you can only store it as a bitmap file. That's a very good question and something that I didn't directly address. Um, it's kind of the question of qualitative versus quantitative analysis. Image simulation is, um, is qualitative. It's not as quantitative like things like um, you know, the ray fan or the OPD plot where you have um, you know, physical units and, and you can look at you know, peak to valley um, changes. This is more of a how does it look and how does it feel. Um, that's why we do talk about image simulation being a very good tool for conveying uh, the performance of a system to non-optics people, so for example to uh, managers or other potential customers. Okay, what would you gain by using real human eye surfaces instead of a paraxial lens? Uh, there are a few differences here. Um, so one is that actually the back of the human eye is, is curved. Uh, so um, the point spread functions would be calculated differently because they won't be calculated at a flat plane. Um, they'll be calculated um, at, at a curved plane matching um, the back of your eye or the retina. Um, in addition, um, the human eye could introduce aberrations too. Um, so there could uh, there are a variety of things, including um, a change in the um, potentially the relative illumination, um, and then different eyes have um, you know, different imaging qualities, um, and so you could incorporate that as well. Okay, could you briefly explain how the Huygens model is used to compute the PSF? Um, sure, so, so the key distinction here is that we have uh, two different diffraction algorithms that you can use. There's the FFT, which is the fast Fourier transform, versus the Huygens model. The key difference between the two is that um, the FFT is an approximation um, that's calculated at the exit pupil, um, so it's, it's not accounting for tilted image planes or, or really um, any, any other effects that are happening at the image plane because again the FFT is calculated at the exit pupil. Um, it also cannot be used for very fast systems but the Huygens model is more accurate. This is using the um, 
Huygens um, wavelet theory um, and integrating all of those wavelets at the image plane. So that calculation is done at the image plane and is accurate for um, a much uh, broader range of systems and that's why it's included in the image simulation um, tool. It isn't as fast as the FFT of course um, and it, it does require a um, higher sampling density. So if you do select the Huygens model, you'll probably need to increase the pupil and image sampling as well. Okay, could you please mention one more time how to calculate pixel size, X pixels and Y pixels for the detector? Um, so the way you calculate, calculate that really depends on your uh, your detector settings. The example that I showed here, I, I just scaled the detector pixels based on the um, input ratio or the X and Y pixels of the input source. So I believe I just doubled the number of pixels in X and the number of pixels in Y, so I maintained the same ratio. And in this example, I just chose a small pixel size that um, would not um, uh, make the uh, imaging quality limited by the detector. Um, but in, in reality, obviously, you'd, you'd want to pick the number of pixels and the pixel size such that it matches your real detector. Um, I'm wondering also, this question might relate back to calculating um, the pixels from the source bitmap as well, because that, that can be a little bit more complicated. Um, so that's why I recommended labeling your input files or source bitmaps with the number of pixels in X and Y because that's what you're going to be using to calculate um, then um, an adequate field height. So I'll just kind of run through that trig calculation. Um, so, so in my input file, that optics and photonics picture, the number of pixels in X was 640, the number of pixels in Y is 495. Um, so if I'm remembering correctly, then if you calculate the hypotenuse in, in pixels, that's um, 809 or 810. And then my maximum field, so that's the um, field unit setting um, in object height, so in units of length, that was 11.5. Um, I actually I don't remember if I showed that in the webinar. But so it was 11.5, and I had specified that as the maximum field point in Y. And so if, if we're just looking at ratios of a right triangle, then the max field in Y of 11.5 um, uh, uh, corresponds to the hypotenuse in pixels of 809. Um, and so from there, you can calculate the um, half Y field also in field units, which is about 7. And so then the full size in Y would be 14. And so that's why I used 14 as, as the input example. And uh, you'll also see those settings uh, saved in the session file um, if you do want to download uh, the ZMAX files from the zipped file that we add to our webinars page. Uh, one other thing to consider is if you want your input um, source file to fit inside that uh, field unit circle, or if you want the field unit circle to fit inside your source bitmap. Um, Typically, it's the former because you want to make sure that your full, full, field, full field area is optimized so that whatever um, source bitmap you put in there will be imaged correctly. Okay, how to show the polarization effect. Uh, so the example that I showed here um, showed the effect of polarization in a, a very simple example using coatings. And, and the reason that that is including the effects of polarization is that you have to, um, you have to include polarization in order to account for the effects of coatings. And in that example, the coating filtered out um, one of the wavelengths. So in the resulting image simulation, um, you could see clearly the, uh, the simulated image um, had all of that one color removed. Okay, one more question. Can you clarify the difference between the field height and the field number setting? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, so the field height is that kind of trig calculation that I just ran through where we were getting the 
14 millimeters is the full Y uh, field height of our source bitmap. The field number setting specifies which field point that source bitmap is centered upon. So in most cases, field one is your on-axis field point, and that's what you will want your source bitmap centered upon. Uh, changing that allows you to very quickly move your source bitmap around your field. So if you move your source bitmap to be centered upon a field that's much further off axis, potentially you know, half of your picture or your source bitmap uh, could be in an area that wasn't optimized. So you'll see significantly more distortion. Uh, next question, is the total effect of PSFs on the grid on the image simulation the sum of individual point spread functions uh, convoluted with the input image? Yes, that's correct. So again, we're convoluting the source bitmap with the effect um, and distortion essentially of all of the point spread functions um, in, in that PSF grid. Actually, I shouldn't say distortion because that's... Um, um, that, that's explaining something else. But I mean, um, the, the effect that we saw where the point spread function spreads out and becomes um, non-uniform, that's the effect that um, gets convolved with our source bitmap, which results in the calculation of our, our imaging quality of the system. Then in between those field points, um, Optic Studio is interpolating. Oh, I got a comment that it would help if we could go back in it and display the screens that relate to these input questions. Uh, that's a very good point, and I think in the future we should um, try sharing our screens again at the end of these webinars. Um, yeah, I'll keep that in mind. That that's a very good point. Okay, can you talk about the relationship um, about the ray aiming and ray aiming cache and the image simulation tool? So ray aiming is an additional algorithm that you can turn on which corrects the um, orientation of the input rays. So um, essentially, let's say you have a stop surface that's embedded in your system. Okay. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, Optic Studio is systematically launching rays to fill the entrance pupil. Um, but if your stop's embedded in your system, that means that the entrance pupil is the image of the stop as seen from the object plane. And as you start adding components in between the stop and the object, uh, that image becomes aberrated. And therefore, the way that we're systematically launching rays to fill the entrance pupil might not actually match where you want the rays to go. Uh, there are two ways you can really quickly analyze this. One is just zooming in on your uh, layout plot and looking at the stop surface. If you see rays that are missing the edge of the stop surface, then you'll know that um, you might need to turn ray aiming on. Um, another way to analyze this is to look at the pupil aberration plot. Um, so that shows the mismatch between where Optic Studio is launching the rays versus where they actually land on the stop surface. So if there are uh, no aberrations, then the uh, pupil aberration plot will just be flat, um, indicating that a ray that we launch at the edge of the entrance pupil also exactly hits the edge of that stop surface. Um, so it, the, the relationship here to image simulation means that the way that we're calculating the point spread functions uh, may differ slightly. Um, so, for example, if the rays aren't quite hitting the edge of your stop surface, then um, they might potentially be more aberrated um, as they move further out on that optical component, so you might see uh, worse performance. Um, but really, ray, ray aiming is kind of this extra algorithm that's used to help out in sequential mode. Um, in reality, your entrance pupil is going to be overfilled, um, so you, you wouldn't need something like ray aiming that doesn't exist in reality. It's just something to help in sequential mode. Uh, sequential mode 
you have to limit the number of rays that are launched and that's part of the beauty of sequential mode as well because it makes it so darn fast you, know, you can optimize intolerance very very quickly whereas in non-sequential mode where the rays are launched in every which way um, you would need way more rays and the calculation will take a whole lot longer um, so I, I hope that addresses your question Oh, okay, so there's another question, uh, kind of a clarifying question about the um, field height setting and image simulation versus the maximum field. Um, I think the language that I'm using is a little confusing because I was saying you need to choose your, um, your maximum field in the field height setting and image simulation, but what you're choosing is something that you're calculating based on the maximum field. Um, so it's not like there's one number that you can pull from somewhere else um, in the UI. It's something that we're recommending you calculate. Um, if you do have more questions about that, uh, just uh, send us an email. You can email support at zmax.com. Just address it to Kristen, and I'll try to pick it up, and I can send you um, some screenshots and diagrams that would help clarify that. What would you recommend for evaluating a projection lens quality which is not determined by sensor dimensions? Um, that's a good question, and, and actually I still think image simulation is, is going to be best. That's because you don't have to calculate the sensor dimensions, or, or you don't have to specify them. If you use zero, uh, which is the default setting for the detector uh, settings for the number of pixels and the pixel sizes, then Optic Studio automatically scales that based on your input settings. So it'll pick a number of pixels that matches the number of pixels in, in your source, and it scales them based on the magnification of your system. Let's see. Um, so there's, there's one other point that I wanted to cover, um, which is about if your object is at infinity. So the examples that I showed in this webinar are um, using object height as my field definition because my object was a finite distance away. If your object's at infinity, you can't define um, the position based on object height because that would also be infinity. Um, instead, you'll probably be using an angle setting, um, but that's a little more complicated because if you have um, angles defining your field setting, that means that your field height and image simulation will also be defined by angles. Um, and, and the reason that that's um, difficult is that um, the angular units for your um, field setting and image simulation um, the angle units don't scale the same across the source bitmap like units of length. So for example, if you have an X direction angle that's also at a Y angle of 80 degrees, um, that will represent a different subtended angle than the same um, X angle at a Y angle of instead 10 degrees. Um, so you do have to be careful if your field is defined by degrees or angles, uh, because if your field of view is, is pretty wide, um, you might, well, you basically have to be very careful interpreting the results. Um, a very fast fix for that or something that you can do um, to instead use units of length as your field height would be to insert a paraxial lens surface uh, before your first object or before your first surface. Um, so then you'll just have to specify the thickness of your object surface as the um, effective focal length of the paraxial lens, and you'll end up getting the same effect where your uh, rays are coming in collimated, but instead you could talk about uh, your, your uh, source bitmap in terms of units of length. Okay, we've run a little bit over time today, so I think I'm gonna wrap things up. If there are any questions that I didn't get a chance to answer, um, please feel free to send me an email. You can email support at zmax.com and just address it to Kristen, and I will try to pick it up. All right, thank you all very much for attending. We really appreciate your support.